do not entrust your children to the school system, to the national school, the national school system. Teach your children. I'm not saying take them out and do homeschooling. Although there have been a few interesting episodes of kids who are educated entirely out of the and, and geniuses. You know what I mean? Like completely original thinkers. Ooh, it's a risk. But I, I, I still think it's worth taking if you if you really feel, and I think with absolute justification that the school system is just really letting down the best and brightest. Mm. So yes, teach your children. I think. Parents, uh, to get angry with the school education system without rising to the responsibility of grounding your children at least, so by the time they actually enter the school system at six or seven years old, they already know the rudiments of learning, how to learn, you know? I don't know, I'm not a, I, don't have, I don't have kids, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I can't really speak about this. But, and, I, and for sure I know my contemporaries have raised some beautiful children among them, so it's not impossible to educate your kids, but one thing I can say, that they have in common, those who I think are justifiably proud of how their kids have turned out, they never let go of their children's education. I'm not just talking about reading and writing, I'm talking about all the way through, a supervisory approach to this. So the involvement of the parents, I think, is the best buffer you can have against the depredations of, uh, of a politically oriented educational system. Thank you. Dear or the non-racial Malaya has been here since the start and that's why it refuses to die too. It's also part of our founding reality. Remember this, this is not an imposition from Western liberal humanist educated people in the post-1969 era. It's been around since forever. Gerakan was a multi-racial party. The People's Progressive Party was a, they were ideological parties, socialist parties, but they were not racial parties. And they haven't, well, they've chopped and changed and failed and Every time we go through a political crisis in this country, the multi, the non-racial or the a-racial idea emerges again. Pakatan was supposed to do this as well. You see, it is a, it's an idea that refuses to die. Ido segar mati tak mau. Hard to live, won't die. So this is why I think it's time to get some respect for that. And well, to begin with, to recognize it. It doesn't have a political uh, platform to express itself. Yet it is a manifest reality. And not only is it a manifest reality, it is also an aspirational reality. Or our asli children have come to me in that little town and asked me to teach them English. I had to let them down because I don't know how. You know, I learned to read English from books. I, I can ask them to read books. I did because I tried to get them to learn Justin Bieber lyrics. <laughs> you know, it worked to a certain extent, but there was a problem. Um, teenage kids, 13 and 15 years old, two young girls came up. I tried to get them that, but I said, look, the only way for you to pick up English is to use it, and the only way to use it is to have others use it with you. So the two of you, cousins, talk English to each other all the time. Oh, problem. Family got very upset. No, 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 rope in your kid, brothers, rope in your siblings. Play games, sing songs, do theater, watch cartoons, read the subtitles, vie with each other to find new words, you know? But keep, bring your family into that process. A great, no, terrible, you're putting on airs, you are, you know, you're trying to be above your state. Uh, weird things that if you, Yuki Omishima, the very nationalistic right-wing Japanese novelist, was one of those who kind of abided by the idea that if you learn one word of a non-Japanese language, you were that much less Japanese. The idea of overwriting, that if you learn a new language, you have to eradicate an old one. This is a fairly durable notion. It, it afflicted us. Bahasa, you know, to promote the use of Malay, it meant suppressing the use of English, which was never, ever the case, because language is thought. Thought is mind. It comes from here. Uh, bilingualism, trilingualism, quadrilingualism is not unknown in this country. In fact, it's relatively common. And none, nobody who learns a language forgets another one in the process. You don't have to forget English in order to learn. Come on, it's insane. So it wasn't about pedagogy, it wasn't about learning. It was about nationalism, patriotism, an extremely exclusionary attitude towards the other. And that was a caricature. Mishima, we know him because he wrote like an angel. An angel inflicted, you know, uh, possessed by demons perhaps, but he did write like an angel. The idea, however, is what has ruined us now. So although English has degenerated into a slurry in the gutter, we do not have yet, I don't see it yet, a maturing modern Malay literature in its place.
I'm sorry, but the old war horses of the 60s are still being trotted out. When was the last time we had a Sastrava Nagara under 70? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not fair on them either. We're all becoming, you know, a little bit, you know, wheeling out these inflated cadavers at every opportunity <laughs> to mumble into their Gandalf beards, <laughs> to get interviews in Off the Edge, written by somebody who not only hasn't read him, but couldn't understand him if he did. <laughs> You're looking at caricatures now, you know? Where is the writing? So that, that was it. That's the, that's the difficulty we have here. We let go of something that we shouldn't have let go of. And now we're grasping to try and get it back, and it's not there anymore. God, that was pessimistic and bleak! I don't think we respect wealth in this country, which is ironic when you see how much status symbolism has become a hallmark of our society. The car you drive, where you live, what you do. I don't think we have. I was with my... And, uh, 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 if anybody were to talk to me about anything at any, at any length, I would, call, I would fall back on the little town where I live and the conversations I have with the people who are my neighbors there. When uh, Forbes produced its... I don't know whether it was Forbes or Fortune magazine or whatever, but it produced its list of the richest, Mal uh, the richest Malaysians, and the usual suspects are on top. But um, uh, one of Mahadev's sons was number nine. Which one? Not I, uh, not Mirzan. The other one. Mahadev! I love the boy! <laughs> now, you look at the list, and there's there's uh, Robert, um, there's uh, uh, Lim Bokke, there's Francis, there's Ananda, there's Mokta, Seven of and then there's this. Now, the, the difference between these person, among these personalities is so obvious, so manifest, that this country is obsessed with wealth in a way. But when you look at this guy, and you think, we all know how the sugar king became sugar king, how Gunting became Gunting, how Whitey Earl became Whitey Earl. We know these stories. How did this guy get to be on this list? <laughs> Number nine? He ain't that smart. <laughs> But okay, maybe he is love. But don't have much smarter than me or my son. So the idea of patronage, the idea of who you are, the idea of who you know as opposed to what you know this counts. Now this has the effect of devaluing wealth. What is prestigious about it? I would only tell you again that I quote my Chinese working class sons of the soil. Salt of the earth. If we're the sons of the soil, they're the salt of the earth. It's like what is respectable, what we look up to, what we tabe one on your knees is what it took to become wealthy. That is why Lin Bo Tom is considered what he is. You look at this wretched mountain range and you see a road going up and a casino on top. Talk about vision. <laughs> you know? So that is where the prestige comes from. And people like Mokta Bukhari, those who began by basically trafficking cows and then building it up, another Christian, true entrepreneurialism. In fact, in the modern, I, can't pronounce, I still can't pronounce that word, I've never heard of it before. <laughs> Tony Fernandez, when they emerge and do these things, and then, you know, that is what wins the respect of the people. When wealth suddenly begins to appear among people like two-bit minor junior league 12th choice politicians who only get to become Mantri Basau because numbers 1 through 11 had all been, have all got skeletons rattling around in their closets, several of them still fully dressed. No, and then suddenly he's got bloody, you know, come on, it devalues wealth. You no longer, you can drive what you like. Live where you wish. We still think you're scum. 